Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The show is about to begin. Cody Perez from American Overdose, and you are listening to the concerts that made us.
Cody, you're very welcome to Concerts That Made Us. Hello. It's great to be here. I'm excited to be a part of the show. Thanks for being here. Now, American Overdose have a new album out on July 12th, Artificial Infection. It's your first album since 2016. What can we expect from it? Yes, uh, very excited. So uh, what you can expect is uh, the sound has evolved. It's still American Overdose. So everything that um, the fans from previous the two previous albums liked uh, with the volume turned up. Um, you know, we we've evolved a little bit, but not too much um, from the original sound. Um, you're going to hear solos, which we didn't have in any of the previous work, guitar solos. Um, there's definitely uh, production has definitely um, gone up uh, as far as the quality um, with each album. You know, we've we've always, you know, improved in that department. So I'm, I'm excited that, you know, it's only continued. Uh, the songs are all bangers. So what I mean by that is you're not going to skip any of the songs. They all have really catchy hooks. There's some really heavy parts, um, some really melodic parts, sing along songs. You know, each one of them has a chorus that I think it will stick with people. Um, so I would say basically what we've done in the previous albums with the volume turned up and with a new kick to it as well. Um a lot of energy in the songs and we have a new track um on the album that we've never done like something like this before where i sing in spanish uh we've always wanted to do a latin influenced track we've talked about it for years and you know be me being uh mexican um and speaking spanish it's been something i've always wanted to do and finally got to do it uh finally got the balls to do it i should say <laughs> um because i was very intimidated my spanish isn't the greatest but um, I managed to get by, and so I feel I feel very proud of this track. Uh, the people that have heard the album so far have all, you know, pointed that song out, especially as a as a favorite track. So, a lot of new things in this in this uh, new album that people can right. expect. Right. How do you think it's going to go down with fans? Then you know, because I I'm not aware of any Spanish new metal songs that are out there at the moment. Well, there's there's uh, you know, El Nino is a is a band that you know, has been around for some time and, and they definitely, um, they're a band that influenced me growing up. Um, and I know that they're still around and doing, doing, uh, their, you know, their music and, and what have you, um, I, you know, so not to scare anybody off, only one song is in Spanish. So, um, I don't want people to think that the whole album is, or a majority of the album, it's just one song in Spanish that I wanted to do, you know, in the future albums, we may do more, but I think the fans will love it because the, the music is very catchy. It's heavy. It's melodic. Um, it's going to stick in your head. I, I, I've heard people compare it to um, something that should belong on a Street Fighter or some action type of movie on the, the music part of it. And then I've even heard that uh, it sounds like something that Rammstein would do, but it's in Spanish. So um, I'm excited to hear the feedback that people are going to have. I think it's going to be one of those songs that people are going to um, hold on to and say that's a standout track. I know we're going to, we're planning on doing a video for it and we're going to do some heavy, heavy promotion um, in the Latin countries, South America and Mexico and Spain and all that. Once, uh, once we make a video for that and make it an official single. Right. Right. Very weird that you mentioned Rammstein because I'm actually wearing a Rammstein t-shirt at the moment. You're not uh, <laughs> spying on me, are you? <laughs> no, no. I, I wish that we could do the video thing. I don't know what's going on with my end of it, but uh, that is awesome, man. Rammstein is definitely one of my favorite bands. It's a band that's influenced American Overdose since the very beginning. Um, I've been lucky enough to see them, you know, one time way back in 2001 on the uh, Pledge of Allegiance tour with Slipknot and System of Down. Um, so that's awesome to hear that you're rocking the, the Rammstein shirt. Yeah, yeah. Now, the album, how did you guys approach the writing of it? So this album... Um, be 100% honest, we started working on music back in 2000, I want to say 17, maybe a little bit sooner than then. And we started working on tracks, then we came up with between then and um, up and through about 2020, we had like 50 songs that we came up with. And um, we were just trying everything we could just to see what we liked. And the band took a, a major hiatus during that time frame uh, due to a lot of everyone in the band had something else going on, whether it be 
you know, being new parents or me, I was going through a lot of personal issues, um, uh, life changes with certain band members, lineup changes, all that type of stuff. Uh, and then COVID, of course, put a halt in it. Um, I started writing at home by myself, um, aside from working on the tracks that we had been working on since 2017. And I came up with a bunch of material on my own. And I found this producer um, from the uh, Ukraine um, on a music website. And I loved the work that he was doing. So I'm like, I have all this material I'm sitting on. I'm going to send it to him and maybe we can, I can start a solo project. And so I sent him some material. He picked some songs that he thought, you know, he could work with. And we exchanged uh, music. Um, and this person was uh, the, the the producer mostly on this album, which his name is Nikolas at NRQ Studios out in the Ukraine. He sent back some music and I was just like blown away. I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, I can put out a solo project and uh get some get some new music out there so i I put out a few tracks between uh 2021 through 2022 and um you know at at that point i was like hey you know why not use him for some american overdose and see what he can do with that and you know i started sending him tracks and he started sending me back tracks of what he was doing with it and then i was it was a no-brainer i was like all right you definitely understand the style of music and what we like to do and um, before you know it, we had a, you know, we had a, a full album's worth of music, and I even grabbed one of my solo tracks and actually added it onto um, this album. In in a weird way, uh, this album was written. Um, it was written kind of backwards because the the track that I used for my solo, the first track I used for my solo project, "Open Eyes," is the closing track on "Artificial Infection." It was meant for my solo project. I released it as a single for my solo project. Solo project, I never did anything with it like live or anything like that. So I just kind of just put it out there for the world, put out a video. And it didn't get the, it got a lot of attention, but it didn't get the attention I really felt like it deserved. Um, so when we were writing this album, uh, Artificial Infection, we were thinking of how we could close out the album because the album starts out kind of dark and in a aggressive way. Um, some of the darkest stuff that I've gone through and, and me just kind of pouring my heart out. And I always like to leave things on a hopeful note for, you know, people to be inspired and know that, you know, no matter how dark things get, they always do get better. And Open Eyes is a very positive track. Um, It gives a lot of hope. It inspires and it's it kind of gives light to the darkness. So I figured that would be the best way to end the album uh, is with adding that track. And so we worked with the producer and basically he. Uh, he changed up the mix a little bit. He added what we used for the rest of the tracks for American Overdose and the drums and, and guitar sounds and whatnot, and just you know, changed it up a little bit to make sure that it fit with the rest of the songs. But a lot of the music was just basically me and the producer, me and Brick, the drummer, um, you know, writing stuff and sending it back and forth with ideas and, and, and feedback and um, just kind of collaborating through uh with with by sending it by web obviously he was out in ukraine we didn't get to go out there but um we would send tracks to the internet and luckily we live in the age of the digital age where we can do that yeah yeah i have to ask you know i'm sure there's listeners wondering did the war kind of affect anything with him producing it? it 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 did it really did uh there was a couple of times where there was delays because he literally was by a building that got blown up uh, which Holy was crap. very scary for us. He had a, you know, he's got a family and everything. And so he would um, let, let us know. He gave us an update. He's, uh, he's like, hey, I'm relocating. A lot of my stuff got damaged. You know, I'm I'm over here. We had to relocate, but I'm still working on it. So uh, props to him for keeping it up. You know, we sent some money over to try to help him and the family. We donated some money um, and we stayed in contact. We stayed patient and, and whatnot. So luckily him and his family have been safe. Uh, you know, I know a lot of craziness is going on out there right now. So um, we're we're happy to know that, you know, he's been he's been unharmed so far, but he's been very close. So it did affect in some aspects where there was delays, but nothing too severe, nothing too crazy. And of course, we were we were being patient. You know, the fans have been waiting for a long time. It's been since 2016 to have new music out. So we were you know, we knew that we had to get something out soon, but we were constantly putting out singles, um, you know, starting with Agastopia. 
2022 and then just kind of were put, putting stuff out there, you know, as, as we were getting it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as you mentioned, it's been a very long time coming. What was the original vision for the album and how close do you think the final version is? I would say it's drastically different. So the original version of it, we were going to be working with, and we did work with him, uh, Christian from Il Nino, the original vocalist, uh, now Lions at the Gate. Uh, me and the uh, the original producer from, you know, the, the first two albums were working with Christian side by side, um, you know, coming up with ideas for the songs. The songs were great, but I was going through a very dark, time in my life uh as i mentioned personal issues um bad relationships a lot of addiction um just just self-destructive uh behavior on my end for a number of years and it all caught up to me and i was letting that uh you know take over my joy of music my joy of anything for for the most part it basically took over um, priority of, of everything, my friends, my family, my relationships, my, my band, which I've, you know, I, I started and, and, and I loved like it was a child of my own. And um, so the music that we were, that we, that was coming up was not where I wanted it to be, or I seen it to be. It was great stuff. It just wasn't that it didn't have that darkness and that um, anger and aggression that I, that I wanted it to have. So when um I started working on my own solo stuff. I noticed that 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 had more of a sound that I liked and what I was going for. Because I was writing literally the guitar, the drums, the keyboards, everything, the melodies and and what have you, and the lyrics. And so um, I decided at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm going to, we'll put this aside. We can always come back to it at another time, the material that we worked on previously. And, um, you know, we have some great stuff there that we can pull from. But right now I need uh, this is what I need to get it all off my chest and get it out of, you know, it's my therapy. Um, So once I started sending over the tracks that I, you know, that I put together myself, I noticed it had exactly what I was looking for. And then when the producer would get his hands on it, Nikolas, um, and send it back to me, I would be like, wow, okay. And, And the lyrics would literally like within a day or two just spill right out of me. and. Uh, the emotions and whatnot. So there were songs that I wrote the same day that I got the music back. I stayed up late at night and just was like, I already have the melody. I already have the hooks. I have the lyrics. And it all just, you know, it flowed really well. There was a couple tracks, you know, where I had to think on it for a couple of weeks. But um, for the most part, this album was really simple to put together because I had so much stuff that I just needed to get out. Um, I would say if I had to compare it, it's like day and night of what the other material was versus this the one song that made it from the original uh is this is the first song on the album which is damaged that one was produced by human which is the original producer from uh the first two albums and co-produced with christian from from lines at the gate il nino Uh, so that song still had that edge the aggression and i felt like it it was a great opener for this album Uh, so that was the one song that definitely made it over from that original um the original lineup of songs but if you're asking about the comparison it's night and day as far as uh the tone i get you i get you you know i know you're not at a point to even think about it yet this album isn't even out yet but we don't have to wait another seven years for album number four do we no 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 (laughs) and it's funny you mentioned that so i am already talking about the new material because we have two new guys a guitar player uh, our guitar player Justin B. Coleman and uh, Josh Rommel on bass. Uh, those guys are phenomenal musicians, and I'm very excited for us to start writing with them. Um, so we've already been talking about the new material that we're going to start working on. We want to get more aggressive uh, with it. We want to take it up another notch from what this last batch of songs were. So as soon as we get back from our run that we're doing here in uh, next, starting this week, this coming weekend, we leave for the road. We're going to come back and we're going to start writing and recording new music. We're going to continue working with uh, Nikolas, a producer in the Ukraine, sending him material. But we plan on writing new music and hopefully have, I think the next one's going to be an EP. So maybe a five or six song EP and hope to have it out in, sometime in 2025. I'm working on, I haven't really discussed this with anybody, but I'm working with a, on a cover with Nikolas right now. Um, I can't say what song it is just yet, but 
I'm hoping to have that done and out this year at some point. Um, so we have some videos coming down the line that we want to release as well. And we're going to, we have to, we still have to do them, but, um, I want to do a video for one of our new songs, which is artificial infection, the title track. And then of course that Muevete track, which is the Spanish track. I want to do a video for that. Uh, but we're going to, we're going to start writing and recording as soon as we get back from the road and, uh, hopefully not make anyone wait any longer than next year for material. And, and like I said, it's going to be more aggressive. These guys come from a background of playing here in the local um, organ metal scene uh, in heavy bands. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to see what they come up with. We actually grabbed one of our old songs uh, from the first album, the song called Enough, um, at practice the other day. And we basically bumped up the BPM on it. It just sounds way better and more aggressive. Um, and we were jamming to it. I'm like, yes, this is exactly what I wanted. And uh, it's it, it's exciting to see what we're going to do and and what what will spill out of us with uh, having the influence of these two new guys. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. You mentioned the cover. You can't tell us the song. Can you at least tell us the band or who sang it originally? Uh, it's a pop artist from the 90s. I can say that. <laughs> right, right. I, Female I love, or male? <laughs> I love 90s music, man. So I was like, okay. I want I want to grab something from a pop artist and I want to uh, make it an American Overdose version of it. We did a Katy Perry cover back in 2017 uh, that we released, and I, I felt like we did a good job on it. Um, and and the fans like it, so we're gonna start. We, we haven't played it in years, but we're gonna play it on this run of shows that we're doing on this little mini tour that we're doing for two weeks. And so um, I that got me thinking. I'm like, you know, like we're we're overdue for a, a, a cover. Uh, the 90s right now seems like it's really popular again, you know, the, the fashions, the music, all that stuff. I'm like, look, I, I want to do a cover. And there's a song that was very popular towards the late 90s from from an artist. And uh, I, I hear the darkness in it. And I'm like, I could see American Overdose doing that, but we're going to speed it up just a little bit. Not too much where it's I, what I don't want to do. And I mentioned this to the producer when we were working on on getting this put together is I, I don't want to do a pop a pop verse punk or pop pop punk version of that where they all they do is add double pedal bunch of screaming and, and guitars to it i want to do it some justice i want to do like what not do what manson did uh, you know as far as slowing it down with sweet dreams but i want to do like where we make it our own and bring our style and our flair to it versus just speeding it up and just adding double pedal and guitars to it like a lot of artists seem to do when when they do covers yeah yeah kind of have it separate from the original, but still pay homage. Yeah, exactly. And I want people to recognize it. So when we play it live, the energy is there. The sing-alongs are able to be done, but, um, you know, not like basically take the cover and do an exact version of the song. I get you. I get you. Now, the podcast is called Concerts That Made Us. So I have to ask you about some concerts, if you don't mind. First off, an easy one. As a concert goer, what concerts do you think have made you? That one's easy, man. So uh, <laughs> the very first concert I ever went to is what changed my life and made me want to be a musician. And uh, this was when I was 14 years old. I remember it was May 4th of 2000. And it was a birthday gift that my mom got me. My mom and my grandma um, became a huge fan of Slipknot. And I was a diehard fan, dude. Like, And, and Slipknot was still playing clubs, club shows. Uh, they were playing, you know, anywhere from 500 to 2,000 people uh, uh, venues. And there's a venue here in town in Portland, Oregon, uh, called the Roseland Theater. And, um, you know, I got my ticket. I went out there with some buddies. And I didn't know what to expect because, um, you know, back then, it back then I had never been to a concert before. Um, and so I didn't know, you know, what the people were going to be like there, what the show was going to be. You didn't know the, the you couldn't look up the set list if you wanted to anything like that you know it was it was, it was still a lot of a mystery when when going to shows nowadays you can see exactly what songs are being played what the show's going to look like on youtube and all that uh so it, the lineup was slipknot one minute silence from uh i believe they're from the united kingdom and um the opener was a band that nobody knew who the hell they were it was a band called mud <laughs> <laughs> right. and um so I, I, you know, we get there, and uh, the the van that was opening up was was Mudvayne. I see this weird guy coming out, screaming at the crowd, 
He's got his beard wrapped up around as long as beard that he had wrapped around his arm. And he's, you know, get, pumping up the crowd, just yelling and screaming. They're all painted up and everything. And I'm just like, whoa, like, and I just saw the, once they opened up, they opened up with dig. I just saw the crowd going ape shit. And you know, none of these people knew exactly. They had no idea who this was. They hadn't been, they didn't have an album out yet at that point. Their album was months away from being released. The LD 50 album. And just the energy that they provided and seeing Rhino, the bass player, you know, running all over the stage, rocking out, slapping the bass and Greg, the guitar player, rocking out in his little robot thing that he did back then. And just the sound of, of all the, you know, the aggression that was coming out from the speakers just instantly was like, wow, like this is amazing. Uh, then, of course, you know, One Man Silence came out, they kicked ass. And then once I saw Slipknot, and just the way they talked to the crowd, the energy that they brought, the way the crowd reacted to them. After I left there, I was like, all right, I need to be a singer and I need to start a band. I need to do, start doing music. Like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm meant to do with my life. Um, just hearing how Corey controlled the crowd, he was able to get them down on the ground, the aggression, how he vented, how he opened up about, you know, whatever issues there were going on that was going on in the industry that they were facing at that time. And, all of that stuff just really got me and, and and it affected me where I was just like obsessed, obsessed with just doing music and wanting to go to concerts and, um, you know, wanting to have that platform where you can vent your aggression, your anger, if you have a message to say, all that stuff. And, and I, right after that, I was, you know, I talked to my buddies, picked up some instruments. I started teaching myself the acoustic guitar, reading, reading tabs on the Internet um, sing along to you know a lot of my favorite bands, Corn and Cold Chamber, Slipknot, um, you know Manson, Pantera, all that stuff. And I, I was like, we're gonna start a band. So we started. I started playing with some high school friends um, in one of my buddies' garage. We'd do covers of Papa Roach, Corn, and Cold Chamber, and all that. And eventually, I went on to you know start my own bands, um, like actual bands, and playing shows with you know in, in the local music scene and whatnot. But I would say that the, the the concert that changed my life was that one, the Slipknot, the first concert I ever went to in 2000. That is one hell of a first gig. Like it's... It, it is. And and I always tell people, I'm like, I don't mind going to Slipknot now because I saw them in their prime, dude. Like I saw them, they got kicked out of playing the Rosen because they were setting things on fire. They were setting <laughs> themselves on fire. They were burning corn magazines. They were burning Limp Biscuit magazines and talking trash. They were lighting each other with lighter fluid. They ended up getting banned, not only for the fire that they started, but I heard from uh, staff members of that venue that I guess after they got banned for playing that, for the fire and all that shit, they literally were smearing like human shit on the walls in the green room and all sorts of crap. I don't know how true that is, but they said they left that place a complete mess, the green room. So they've been banned since 2000 from playing the Roseland Theater, and I doubt that they'll ever get to play there again. Yeah. But um, the, the, just the the energy and the craziness that I saw, you know, at being 14 years old, I was like just in complete awe. And so now when I go see Slipknot and, you know, people pay all this crazy amounts of money to be in the pit tickets or to be like, in seats that are up close and all that, I'm like, I'll sit back and watch and enjoy it. I've seen them, you know, plenty of times up close and personal and, and nothing's going to beat me seeing them in a club ever. So, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I've seen them in their prime, and I'm just I'm happy that they're still doing it and kicking ass out there. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you actually brought up Slipknot because I'm sure lots of people are wondering, and you've probably been asked it loads of times. How do you handle the comparison to Slipknot? I always tell people, you know, of, of course there's going to be that comparison. There's going to be people that mention that and, and want to you know, say this and that. But I always tell them, I, I say, if you really listen to our music, like you listen to tracks like Dead Girl on the Dance Floor or songs like Toxic or, um, you know, even from our old album, Cyber Superstar, Slipknot's never done uh, a song that's got like a dance pop influence to it. Yeah, some people will compare you know, psychosocial or, or certain songs like that have a pop element to them because they're radio friendly and they're catchy. But as far as like using like some of the, the like, like on a song called Medicate with us, we use some e- EDM slash um, what's that? What's that style of music that was being used in like 2012? Uh, not Degent. It was uh, Skrillex did it. Uh, 
bands for looks season. Anyways, so we use a lot of dance music, EDM, and that kind of influence as well in inside of our music. Um, so I, you know, it's fine if they want to compare us to Slipknot. There's a lot of the bands that use masks and makeup, especially now. Um, what I always say is, here's the thing: American Overdose was doing masks when it was not cool. American Overdose <laughs> was doing new metal when it wasn't cool. We started in 2009, and the whole idea when I started this band is I said, I want an image to the band. I want, um, you know, theatrics. I want people to come and see a show. I want them to be like, wow. Back in 2009, a lot of what was popular was, you know, deathcore, metalcore. It wasn't cool to play metal, new metal at all. It was, you know, the new metal had still been dead for a long time. Everyone was focusing on breakdowns and blast beats and all that stuff. We were doing new metal before it became popular recently. And so now you see all these bands that are doing new metal. You see all these bands that are doing makeup and theatrics and masks. And I'm not saying we created it by any means. We did not. And I'm not going to, you know, even go there. But we were doing it when it wasn't popular, when no one else was really doing it besides, you know, the, the big ones like Mushroomhead and Slipknot and Guar and Mudbane. And so now you see these bands all doing it from, you know, bands that are doing it right and bands that are doing it kind of cheesy and bands that are doing it, you know, mediocre. Um, so whenever, whenever I, 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 the thing that, one thing that annoys me is when people don't do their research and they don't understand that the band has always done new metal since it first started back in 2009 and has always done masks since the beginning of this. It's not like we we saw a trend happening or like, oh, let's put on the masks. Um, so people will compare us to Slipknot. You know what? That's a great thing because Slipknot is one of the biggest, baddest bands out there. And so to be compared to, you know, something that's doing great things, there's nothing wrong with that. If people want to take it, that's how they perceive it and that, that's how they, they interpret it. That's perfectly fine with me. But I always tell them, you know, take, take a listen to our discography and you'll see that, you know, we're... Slipknot has a very unique style of what they do with their music and how they do their drums and guitars and how chorus vocals work and whatnot. You know, they're, you're going to hear comparisons and, and, and similarities, but I would say that um, with our music, it's it's very different than than Slipknot if you actually open your mind and, and start listening to, um, you know, the music part of it and, and take your focus off of the masks. Yeah, yeah. Great answer. I like it. I like it. Thank now, you. your own shows for any listeners that haven't been lucky enough to catch one of your shows what are they like give us the full experience if you can well um i always tell people that the shows are very intense there's a lot of energy going on and a lot a lot of things going on so we put on a show purposely with intent to have people watch us and and not want to walk away um, you know, or grab a beer or whatnot. So we have our lights that are syncopated with our music. Um, so what you'll hear is when you're seeing the band, the, the lights are strobing to the beat of the music. Uh, they're cued to go exactly with 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 what's being done. Um, and the reason why it works like that is because of um, uh, we have a click track that we have for our drummer and, you know, the samples that come through for the keyboards and, and whatnot. So those are all syncopated with the music. Uh, the lights and then you know we have props that we'll bring out on stage with us between on, on certain songs if they fit the theme of the song of the album or sorry the theme of the song that we're playing um the the crowd they'll go crazy and they'll sing along to it but for the most part they stand there and they will like they'll bop their heads but they're watching us like they're watching a movie and at first it it throws you off a little bit because it's like, okay, are they digging it or are they not digging it? But they <laughs> yeah. stay there and they stand there and they're watching and they got their cameras out and they're videotaping and, you know, they post it online and whatnot. Um, but, you know, it, from, from the perspective that we have from being on stage, it's like, okay, come on, move. Let's see some, let's see some more <laughs> movement. Like, why are you just standing there and just watching? But it almost looks like they're in a trance from our perspective and they're just staring to see what's going to happen. But the, the awesome thing is that we're moving around everywhere and we try to get them to, you know, sing along and bop their heads and encourage them. I would say that, you know, you're going to get intensity from us. There's going to be a uh, shock value to it, you know, in a sense, because some of, like I said, some of the props that we use, um, it's going to be a good time. It's like, I always say it's a party and and I don't mean like, oh, you're going to be, you know, drinking and drugs or any of that. No. Um, it's it's a party as, as a, in a sense where we're having fun. We're making sure you're having fun. The crowd's having, you know, singing along. And uh, we want to give you something that you're going to remember and you're going to want to, you know, come and meet us afterwards. Um, the shows, we always make it. Um, we always make it a point to let people know that if they want to hang out with us and meet us, we're going to be over by the merch booth or we'll, be, or we'll be hanging around, you know, for the bands that are playing before us or after us. 
and, you know, rocking out to them. And people can always come up and take pictures with us, buy some merch, whatever the case may be. And if you don't buy anything, come say hello. We want to meet you. Uh, we treat the, the listeners like they're friends and family. We don't, I know the word gets thrown around fans and whatnot, but I just say they're, it's all a bunch of friends because, you know, it's, we, we build stories with these people and hang out. And, and, you know, every time, like we have a show somewhere, like, you know, we can play a show out in Lubbock, Texas. And we, you know, there might be something crazy that happens at that show while we're hanging out. And, you know, these people will remember it and they'll post about it on, on social medias and our socials and they'll comment on it. Oh, I remember when, so and so this happened and that and, and you know we remember it as well and, and um so we we make it a point that we want people to know that you come to the show you're gonna be friends and family of the band and that's that's how it is and, and i want we want you to leave with that with that feeling hmm. it actually sounds more like it doesn't sound like a show or a, a concert it sounds more like an experience if you get me that's a good way to put it man i like that i'm gonna start using that i'm gonna steal that from you <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're right that is, it, it is an experience it ex, it's exactly that it's holy shit I, I never even looked at it that way but yes you're right yeah yeah now you know in the past you guys you've played major festivals like rock fest and warp tour to name a few you've also played with the likes of corn godsmacked disturbed five finger debt punch i could go on for hours now listing everyone but is there a gig you've played where you know it was the high point it couldn't have got any better um let's see well we've done yeah we've been lucky and fortunate enough to play a lot of different shows i can't pinpoint one exactly but those big festivals that you mentioned, yes, um, th those are the points where you're just like, wow, we get to be a part of this. This is we're experiencing this it's something that, you know, a lot of bands don't get to do um, and a lot of people don't get to do and don't get that. You know, they're not fortunate enough, you know, to, to experience that. Um, I kind of felt that just recently. So we played the Milwaukee, the Jamie Jostin from Hatebreed, his, his festival, uh, Milwaukee Metal Fest. I felt that there just recently we played there uh, in May out in milwaukee wisconsin and to be a part of something that was that's so iconic like that festival has been around for i want to say 25 30 years plus and uh to be a part of that with so many great bands both the the older bands and the newer bands that are up and coming uh was an experience that i just was like wow here we are like you know we may not be the heaviest band on this lineup we're, we're probably one of the lighter bands but we're here, the fans, you know, that we're playing in front of a, 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 a different generations of, of, of fans, both the young people and the older people. And and we're getting a lot of exposure here and we're getting to, you know, get that VIP treatment from the other bands and from the people that were hosting the, the event and all that. Um, that was really a, a moment for me that, that stood out. Um, and it's probably because it just happened recently. And I'll probably say that after we play Rockfest in next week, uh, just because Rockfest in itself is is a crazy, crazy experience. And we're lucky enough that we've been invited for the second time to play it. Um, I would say that, man, like those festivals definitely make all the hard work worth it. But then again, when we went on tour with Mushroom Head, we were playing um, in front of a lot of people, anywhere from 500 to 2000 people a night. And we played some legendary venues like, you know, Harpo's out in Detroit, Michigan, uh, venues that I only saw on YouTube and I saw a lot of my favorite bands playing them like Pantera and Slipknot. I've been on that stage and I'd seen them on YouTube, you know, playing those stages. Uh, the Agora in Cleveland, Ohio, like just playing that legendary venue with 2000 people in front of us was just like breathtaking. And it's just like you almost black out on stage when you're playing because it, it happens so quickly and you just can't believe it. And you're trying to take it all in. Um there's not one moment that stands out luckily for us. And I think it's probably because we've been doing it for so long now that, you know, um, we have our ups and downs. Like we have our shows that, you know, we might be playing for only five, 20 people, 30 people, whatever. And then we have those shows where there's like 2000 people in front of us. Um, so every time that we get to play one of these bigger shows, to me, it's like, wow, I, I don't get used to it at all. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, it's always new. It, it it's almost yeah. It's almost new. Um, so there's not one. I would say those festivals are always something really really special. But then sometimes you know those the smaller shows where people uh, sit around they'll wait for you. Like we played some shows where they didn't start till really late, and unfortunately a lot of people left 
But then there's those diehards that stuck around because, and it's a Monday night or Tuesday night, they stuck around because they wanted to see you and they're singing along to every song. Those shows stand out just as much because then it's like, all right, we got to put on a show for this person. We had one on 4th of July back in 2018 that we played in Austin, Texas, that I will always remember. There was only two people there. There was uh, uh, there was uh, a friend of ours, John. Uh, so shout out to John for sticking around and showing up. And then there, I think there was the bartender maybe that was there. Um, maybe a couple staff members, but it was 4th of July. So we didn't expect much, you know, especially being in Austin where it was really busy everywhere else. Um, you know, that guy, that guy stuck around. He rocked out for us. We put on the full show, the whole get up. We drank with him backstage. We, you know, we played one, we, we played a song that he wanted us to play that we didn't even have, um, plan to play on the on the the whole tour but because he was there and he demanded it i was like you're stuck around we're gonna do it and had him sing along with us and, and whatnot so there's there's moments like that for sure that stick out and and i will always remember just because something like that you know is is not something you can just forget um so i i appreciate every moment especially now now being sober i appreciate any chance that i get to get on stage so every time that i do get up on there as cheesy as it sounds it's like a is this the last time I'm able to do this? I'm going to give it my all. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Now, if we take that question and flip it around, over your entire career, is there a gig you would say is the worst experience you've had? Everything went wrong, and how did you overcome it? <laughs> um, You know, probably the worst experience I ever had was probably when I've been under the heavy influence of uh, substances. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's see. There's been shows where I just literally came and I can't even do the vocals. Like I just stop and just it's done. Show. Um, how did I fix that? How to recover? Well, I've stayed sober. I'm about to hit ten months sober in uh, on the seventeenth of this month. Oh, man. Um, Congratulations! With with playing in a band that uses a lot of electronics, whether that be the lights or our 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 laptop that has you know the the samples that come through it and whatnot. There's always going to be times that, you know, we have glitches here and there. What we typically do is, you know, if we have to stop and just and just uh, restart the song, we'll do it. Uh, sometimes we're just say we'll just say, screw it. We're just going to keep going. And, and we know we don't have the metronome going to the drummer's ear anymore. So we're going to the beat of his music or what he's doing. Uh, there's been times where the microphone literally was not working and I'm screaming off the top of my lungs, you know, to keep the lyrics going. So typically we we just we kind of feel get a feel for what's going on and what we can do and just hammer it out that way. Right. Right. Not too bad. Not too bad. Right. Before we dive into the last couple of questions, then future plans, you've mentioned tours, give us all the details if you can. Yeah. So um, we're going to be hitting the road uh, here on, well, we leave on Sunday, but um, we're going to be leaving the road here to head out to the Midwest we got invited to play Rockfest, luckily, um, for the second time. So I'm super excited for that. Um, so along the way, we decided to make, we decided to start playing shows along the way to and from Rockfest. So um, we will be, we'll be hitting up uh, places like, well, the first one we're stopping at is in Lincoln, Nebraska at the eight, 1867 bar on July 16th. We'll be hitting up uh, Springfield, Missouri at Lindbergh's Tavern on July 17th. We'll be playing in Joylet, Illinois at the Forge with September Morning um, and Lilac um, on July 18th. We're really excited about that one because uh, they they have two different venues within that venue and the shows were going to be split, but they decided to combine them yesterday. And so I'm very excited for that. We've played with September Morning and toured with them back in the in the Mushroom Head tour and we've made friends with them and, and they're a great band. Um, then of course we're playing on Friday, July 19th at Rockfest in Cadott, Wisconsin. Uh, we play right after Shinedown, we're playing the after party. So we'll be playing around 1255 and we get 90 minutes. Um, we're excited to be a part of that. So stick around for Rockfest to see us. Then, uh, we plan on hanging out for the next day, just to kind of promote the band, hand out flyers and what have you. And then we'll be making our way down to Topeka, Kansas. We'll be playing at the Booby Trap Bar on July 12th, or sorry, July 12th. 21st and then we make our way to denver colorado to play the roxy theater on july 22nd we'll head over to salt lake city utah to play at liquid joe's on july 23rd 
Then we're playing Las Vegas, Nevada on July 24th at a club called Sinwave. And then we're having our CD release party on um, the 9th of August here in Salem. I know it's about a month after our CD releases, but it's going to be our first quote unquote hometown show. So we're making a CD release. We're playing, um, you know, uh, a show for our friends here. So we're excited about that at the Infinity Room. As I mentioned, we're planning on shooting a video for um, one of the tracks, Artificial Infection, and then also for Muevete. So those those will probably happen in August, September, and um, start pushing those singles. And then we're also going to be writing and recording for us to release an EP in um, in 2025. So that's what we have planned right now. We'll see if we have more shows that get added throughout the year. Um, likely, it would be regional regional shows. We're not planning on any more touring uh, for the time being. And then hopefully next year, we'll get to do some touring. We'll see if we can you know, do a package deal with uh, in, uh, a national band or something. But we'll, we'll see what the future holds on that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, hearing all those dates, you're making me want to like hop on a plane and head over to the States just to catch one of them. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome, man. It'd be cool to meet you. Where, where are you at? Ireland. Ireland. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, pretty far away. Man, that, that just like... <laughs> When I hear when I hear certain things like ask, uh, accents and whatnot, I instantly like hook onto them. So I, uh, the way I said Ireland right now was the way you kind of said it, and I mirrored it because I heard it. And, and it's <laughs> right. funny whenever I go to whenever I go to different states that have like if I go down to Texas or down the south or I go to like North Carolina, South Carolina, I instantly once I hear people talking, I like I don't even do it on purpose. It's just like my mind <laughs> goes right into it, and I pick up on the accent. I just start doing it. I, I can't stop. <laughs> uh, but that would be awesome to go out there, man. I would love, that would be a dream come true. We've been wanting to go to Europe and, and I hope that someday we'll get to do that. Um, yeah. You know, if, yeah. if we ever get the support from a label or something that, that, that pushes for that. Yeah. You guys, oh, there's plenty of festivals around Europe, you know, in Germany, France, all over that you guys would be perfect for, you know, you, you'd kill it over here. That would be amazing. I've always heard people say that, you know, out here in, in America, you know, that we're we're really picky about the music, and we are. Um, you know, it's it's very um uh it's people are are so stuck in their ways and not as open-minded, but out in Europe, like you'll have like a variety of different genres of music just blending and mm -hmm. and, and bands will talk about how they'll play it out here a 300 seater and then they'll go out there and play like for five thousand, ten thousand people, you know, like yeah. so I I am dying to go out to europe and, and and go be able to play out there europe and australia are on that top list and someday i'm, I'm planning to make it happen definitely definitely right we'll uh, dive into the last couple so these are a couple of fun random ones i'm intrigued to see your answers first off yes. besides music what are you currently obsessed with um well right now it's it's weird i am obsessed with just living life man like Getting sober made me appreciate um, everything I have in my life, like literally everything. My job, you know, my friends, my family, my dogs, my girlfriend, um, just living life and being able to see the sun rise and not be hung over, not having any regrets, not, uh, you know, feeling like I'm a slave to, to you know, to a, a poison. Um, so I'm up, I'm just obsessed with living every day in the moment now and just enjoying the company I keep around me. And I love to cook, uh, love to go swimming. I, I, I do like to run as well. So I do a lot of uh, running on the treadmill, um, hanging out with my boys, my two little dogs. Um, just just living in the moment, man. That's what I'm obsessed with right now. Like I. I enjoy waking up early in the morning and going out for a drive and just the cold air hitting me and seeing the sunshine and, and all that kind of stuff. It sounds weird, I know, but no, that's I my like official it. answer. I like that. it. It's good. It's good. I like it. The next one, bit of an odd one. If you had to spend 24 hours locked in a room with any musician from history, who would it be? That's a good one. Um, let's see. That is a crazy one. Um, that is that is a hard one. There's a lot of them. Mm. Um, I would like to take experience from Corey Taylor, honestly. You know, he's he's a crazy guy, and he's been through a lot, and he's a great 
great musician. So I, I would like to sit with him and see what I can learn from him. I like it. I like it. I feel like you'd have to put a rule in place, though. No human shit on the walls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and the uh, the final one. So what's your go to album? What's an album you always revisit? It's an album I always revisit. Um, so Mudbane is one of those bands that I just constantly find myself blasting. So LD50, uh, their first major label album. Uh, that's that album just has the peaks and valleys that I love in music, like where it goes melodic, crazy, melodic, crazy, heavy, weird. Um, LD50, I would say, is the, the album that I always find myself blasting. Perfect. Great choice. Cody, listen, it has been a blast now. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks a million. It has been a blast, man. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, and, and interviewing and showing the interest. Oh, you pretty little thing. <laughs> I just want to ruin your life. Let me hear you scream. Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please rate and review us on iTunes and Spotify. And if you're interested in signing up the Band Builder Academy, use the link in the show notes below and enter the code CONCERTS and you'll receive 10% off. So, until next time.
Keep rocking. Hey. Hey, what are you guys still doing there? The show is over. It's over. You can go home. Go on. We'll see you next time. We'll be here. Bye.